Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Between the Pillars, the Fisher Library's video podcast series, where you get to learn a little bit about our staff, you get to learn a little bit more about our collections. Um, as you can see, we're not at the Fisher again. Uh, we are, it's the, it's, we're toward the end of April here, and we're in another uh, lockdown, both the city and the province. So, um, so we, in the interest of health and safety, we're again doing this, uh, doing, doing the next few uh, remotely. So hopefully we'll be back in the library at some point in, uh, in the fall, or we're all starting to get uh, vaccinated now. So that's, that's good news. And hopefully come the fall, we'll be able to start doing these again um, live and in the library. But in the meantime, um, please sit back and enjoy this episode. As you see, I've got my colleague here, uh, Timothy Perry. Timothy, Tim and I both have uh, what I would would say our COVID hair at this point. Uh, neither of us, I think, have had a haircut for the last uh, last several months. But um, November two thousand and nineteen for me. Two thousand exactly. <laughs> so, uh, but Tim is here to today talk about uh, French manuscripts. But before we start talking about French manuscripts, let's talk a little bit to, about Tim himself. And uh, Tim's been on quite a journey, I would say, before he finally landed at the Fisher a couple of years ago. Um, so, Tim, you've been a prof. You've been a librarian, uh, you've been a student at U of T. Maybe you can kind of give us the quick Reader's Digest of, um, of, of your career so far. Yeah, so I've, uh, I've been in Canada basically since 2004, I think it was, um, when I came to Toronto. I did my PhD at, uh, at U of T uh, in, uh, in classics. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been sort of bouncing back and forth a little bit between Canada and the US, but mainly in Canada. So after I finished, I was, uh, as, I was at Dartmouth College, as you said, I was, I was a prof for a couple of years at Dartmouth College down in uh, New Hampshire. Then I came back uh, to U of T, did my uh, master's at the high school uh, in library science. Uh, then back down to the University of Missouri, where I was, uh, as a special collections librarian. Uh, and then back again to, um, to Toronto, to the, to the Fisher. That was in 2018. Some people might wonder where your accent is from. So yeah, not originally from either Canada or the US, as you can uh, as you can tell, I'm sure. Um, yeah, New Zealand, originally from New Zealand. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, so you you have a background in in classics, and obviously that's how you've come to um, work with the manuscript collection at Fisher. Maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of your past experience then as a student and as a prof working with manuscripts, and even before that, let's talk a little bit about manuscripts. I mean, when we talk about manuscripts what are we essentially talking about so yeah manuscripts are books that are written by hand um, and not only books anything written by hand um, that you could describe as a manuscript as opposed to say a printed book um, so you've uh, you've got a, a machine essentially um, creating the text on the on the page so anything that's actually written out by hand um, and it's from the latin manus hand scriptum something written so manuscript is just literally something that's been written out um, written out by hand. Right. And so your, so your past experience and obviously you've worked pretty extensively with, with various manuscript collections. Yeah, so in some ways I'm a little ashamed to say when I was, when I was a PhD student, I did go to the Fisher, um, but I didn't use it probably as much as I should have um, when I was doing my PhD in classics. My topic didn't really require it. Um, but yeah, I, I used to, I used to, well, I, I saw the papyrus collection um, uh, at the Fisher at that time, but I didn't, I didn't use the Fisher grade deal. It was only really when I started doing my master's okay. um, that um, I got really interested in, uh, in rare books. Um, I, I already had some interest um, and used the Fisher quite extensively um, and some of the other uh, collections at, at U of T. And then, of course, I got this job at Missouri where I was a special collections librarian um, and worked with their manuscripts um, collection. Um, and they have, that's a, they have a fairly small collection, but a very nice collection of manuscripts there. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was my main sort of previous experience as a, as a librarian working with, uh, working with manuscripts um, before I came to Fisher. Generally speaking, I mean, does, does the Fisher have a great strength in, um, in early manuscripts? Uh, yeah, we, we, we do have a very nice collection. Um, we, I mean, we can't compete with someone like, I don't know, the Bibliothèque Nationale or the British Library or whatever. We're not, we're not at that sort of, uh, that sort of level. Um, but we have a very good range um, of manuscripts. We have, a, we have a very good teaching collection, certainly. Mm -hmm. we, we have most of, most of what you need to teach, um, to teach medieval manuscripts. And um, there's always a few holes here and there that, we, that we're still trying to, um, to fill. Uh, we are trying to diversify the collection. We'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more um, later. And I mean, it's also it's also a, uh, there's plenty of research potential there as well. 
um, right. for sure. Um, so yeah, it's not the biggest collection in the world um, by any means, but it's um, there's some there's some really good stuff in there. There's there's some really good stuff in there. So we decide you've decided to focus in on specifically on our French manuscript collection. Um, first of all, why did why did you decide on on that particular topic? So a few reasons, I guess. I mean, part, partly it is personal interest. Um, my undergraduate was in classics and French, um, so I do have a, a bit of a background in French. Um, the other main reason, I guess, is that it's a part of the medieval manuscript collection that we've been uh, able to develop uh, in the last few years. So we have uh, we have been buying uh, manuscripts in this area. I think all of the manuscripts we look at today we will have acquired in the last sort of four or five years. Okay. Um, I guess that sort of then leads to the question, why are we acquiring in that area? And again, there's a couple of answers to that. I mean, partly it's, I mean, we're a Canadian institution. French is obviously a very important language um, uh, in Canada. Okay. Um, English language medieval manuscripts are very hard to come by for a variety of reasons. Um, so we would love to get some English language manuscripts, but they're, but they're hard to get. French manuscripts, a little bit more, um, a little bit more frequent um, on the market. Um, so, so it is an area that we that we can develop. Uh, as I say, we're also trying to diversify the collection. In medieval manuscripts, it's sometimes a bit of a challenge. Um, but one of the things we're trying to do is buy more vernacular manuscripts. A lot of what we have is in Latin, right. um, so we're trying to buy in in some of the vernacular um, languages. Um, and you'll, as you'll see, one of the one of the manuscripts we're going to talk today was uh, preserves a text written by a woman, um, and that's another thing we've been trying to uh, trying to do, get. Get manuscripts that were um, made by women, made for women, owned by women, um, have texts that were written by women. Um, so yeah, one of the ones we'll look at today is uh, uh, as an example of that. More generally, we're trying to diversify the whole manuscript collection, not just medieval right. manuscripts. So we've been buying, for example, uh, we recently bought uh, three Ethiopian um, manuscripts, um, rather later uh, in date. But um, but yeah, more this is part of a more sort of general, um, more general goal to diversify what we have. So why don't we why don't you see, why don't we take a look to see what you've uh, you want to show for us today? Yeah. Okay. So I'll uh, I'll share my screen. And it is a pity in some ways we can't be at the library because um, although we have these great images of the manuscripts, to be able to see them and hold them and leaf through them is is something entirely different than just looking at a series of images. Yeah, it is a very different experience, and I'll, I'll I'll kind of touch on that at one point. How that kind of um, changes the way you look at uh, the, right. uh, you look at uh, that you look at manuscripts when we get to the second manuscript and uh, manuscript in particular. Perfect. Uh, but okay. let's start with this one. Uh, so this is one of the earliest complete manuscripts um, in French um, that we have uh, have at the Fisher. It's early fourteenth century, so around thirteen hundred to thirteen twenty. It was made sometime in that uh, in that period. It's really difficult um, to put accurate, as, you know, specific dates on a lot of this material, isn't it? Yeah, it can be. Yeah, I mean, some, sometimes you're lucky enough to have um, usually the scribes or the person writing the manuscript um, writing often at the very end of the, uh, of right. the text, um, writing the date. Um, but we don't always get that by right. any means. Um, so yeah, sometimes it can be very hard to tell. Um, so then you have to sort of fall back on things like um, stylistic features. So the, the, the different scripts, the different styles of handwriting change over time. So you can sort of use those to date uh, manuscripts sometimes. Different styles of illustration change over time. Um, so things like that um, uh, can be used for a manuscript like this to try and work out um, uh, when it was actually, when this particular copy was made. Because the text that it preserves is uh, several hundred years older than this particular copy. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is one of our older French manuscripts. It's also the only one we're going to look at today that is uh, a text that wasn't actually written in French originally. So this is a translation. Okay. Uh, this is a, a French translation. And it's a bit of an odd text in terms of um, its origins. So if you start reading this text, what it will tell you is that it's a letter written by the Greek philosopher Aristotle to Alexander the Great, who was a pupil of his, um, with advice on sort of how to be a good ruler and all sorts of other um, things as well. Um, that's not actually what it is. It's pretending to be that, but that's not actually what it is. This, this was probably written in the 10th century, in okay. fact, so well over a thousand years after Aristotle died. And it was originally written in Arabic. 
Um, so the, the original version was, was, was an Arabic um, uh, work. And um, it's pretending to be Greek, kind, mainly because at this time um, in the Islamic world, um, Greek literature is, is quite prestigious from about the eighth century on. Uh, and so one way to make your own work prestigious is, I mean, there's a lot of work being translated out of Greek, but even original works, people will sort of claim, this is actually a Greek text I found and I'm translating it, even if it's, it's not, it's an original Arabic um, work. Okay. So yeah, anyway, that, that's what's going on there. But um, so it was originally written in Arabic, translated into Latin, um, and then became very popular in, in the Latin speaking um, part of Europe. Uh, the part of Europe where Latin was uh, was was used, um, and from Latin it then gets translated into a whole range uh, of languages. One of which is French. It's very very popular. It survives in hundreds and hundreds of different manuscripts. Um, there are at least twelve French translations, and I think this is um, one of only four manuscripts that preserves this particular French um, translation. So, can you talk a little bit about the illumination then? Yeah, so as you can see, this is um, this is quite a nicely decorated uh, manuscript. This this page, at least, most of the other pages are just um, just text. They have illuminated initials, right. uh, sort of capital letters. But this one's got a bit more elaborate um, uh, uh, illustration decoration. Um, so top right there, which is obviously just a close up of the uh, of the from the main page. So we have there um, an initial, so a capital letter um, with a little. Um, a little picture sort of incorporated into it. Mm -hmm. What that is, is on the left, you've got Alexander. Mm -hmm. um, you can tell he's a king because he's wearing a crown. He's got a, he's got, I think he's got an orb and he's got a sword. So these are all sorts of the things that a king holds. Okay. Um, and on the right, it's not actually Aristotle. Um, it's Aristotle's messenger. Oh. You can't really see the book. He's holding a book and giving, um, giving, a, giving the book to, to Alexander. So in the text, again, it describes how Aristotle gives the book that he's just written this letter, which is basically a book, it's a long letter. He's written it up, he gives it to a messenger, the messenger gets sent off and gives it to Alexander. So that's the scene that we've got, um, that we've got here. And then down the bottom, we've got um, what are called drolleries. So these sort of kind of whimsical um, illustrations that you often get in, uh, in medieval manuscripts, especially in the borders. Right. Sometimes they're kind of satirical and they, and they have a clear point. They do relate to the text uh, quite clearly. Sometimes they're just there, kind of this decoration, kind of for fun. So here we have, it's probably a, it's a little the image is a little dark but on the right there you've probably got a, um, a monkey blowing a horn so a mm -hmm. hunter and then right. you've got a, a hound chasing after a chasing right. after a hare and these things all kind of they they all kind of mean something so the hare is usually representing sort of purity the hound is usually lust monkeys are often sort of lust lasciviousness here it's unclear if that how much of that's going on because that doesn't really relate right to the text but um they, they could just be here because they because they're kind of uh, they're kind of fun so i love the page layout yeah it's nicely done it's it's that yeah. uh, they they were very careful when they when they um when they made these made these manuscripts um they they did think really hard about you know how the pages were designed how how the how the text and the image uh decoration how they would work together and look on the page this would have actually been quite a bit bigger this page right. um you can see the, the margins are pretty small. Okay. Um, it's probably, it, it, well, it's certainly been trimmed. When a, when a book gets rebound, um, generally what happens is the page gets trimmed. So this one's in a fairly modern binding. It's, yeah. it's gone through probably more than one right. rebinding. And each time it will have got a bit smaller, unfortunately. But Okay, so what's next? So next up we have, um, and this is, uh, you were saying it's sort of, it's unfortunate that, that we're not at the library because there's something about holding the, the physical book obviously um, and this is an example of kind of something that you, you miss when, when you're not there holding the book this manuscript is much much bigger than the previous manuscript which is not necessarily obvious from mm -hmm. uh, from the two images so that that um, previous manuscript the, uh, the letter from from Aristotle that that you could easily hold in one hand right. um, it's, it's a fairly small uh, manuscript. This one you'd need two hands to hold, um, and if you were actually going to read it, you'd probably want it um, uh, on a lectern or, or a desk or something. It's quite a large, it's quite a large scale um, manuscript. Uh, this is the first page of of text, and it looks like um, you know the, the manuscript begins without any sort of fanfare. Um, what's actually happened is that the first few pages have been lost. You would have had manuscripts didn't have title pages, right. um, but you probably would have had a little bit of text in red. Um, called a rubric, which would have given the sort of 
probably would have given the title of the work and um, you know, who wrote it and that sort of thing. Um, so this is uh, this is actually you know th this is a long poem and we're actually about a thousand lines in by the time our manuscript begins because the first the first pages have been right. been long. Uh, so this is the uh, Roman de la Rose, so the Romance of the Rose, which is a very famous French, um, old French poem. Um, it was written in the in the 13th century in, in, in two stages. It's interesting, the first 4,000 lines or so, um, so this part that you can see now, because we've only lost the first 1,000 or so lines, mm -hmm. um, was written by a, go, a guy called um, Guillaume de Loris, who, who wrote a poem about 4,000 lines long. It's on courtly love. Um, it's about a lover who, um, uh, it's well, it's couched in the form of a dream. It's a, it's about a, a lover who, in this dream, um, dreams of a walled garden with a rose in it. And of course, the rose is an allegory. Um, it's a symbol for his his beloved, and he's got to try and get to his uh, to his beloved. Right. Anyway, a uh, courtly love that that sort of thing. So it's about four thousand lines long. Um, he wrote it in about 1230, 1235. And then about forty years later, someone else came along. Um, this was fairly common in medieval literature. If you if you read a poem, you know, you didn't just have to be like, wow, that's a nice poem. You could just keep writing it. You just add a continuation on, on the end of it. Sort of like, almost like fan fiction or a spin-off or something like that. Um, so this guy, uh, Jean de Mun came along and um, Jean de Mun, and he uh, he decided he liked this poem. He wanted to, to, to keep it going. So he wrote another 18,000 lines of, wow. uh, of poetry, but it's quite different. It's much more, it's much more satirical. Right. Um, and uh, it's still the base, same basic kind of the lover trying to find, trying to get to his beloved. Um, but it's much more sort of satirical. It goes off in all sorts of um, digressions, as you can imagine, because it takes some 18,000 verses. So. Um, this is an illustrated copy. Mm -hmm. um, this poem often survives in illustrated um, manuscripts. A lot of the manuscripts are illustrated, uh, as this one is. Um, so you can see three of the uh, of the uh, of the miniatures there from various points in the poem. And um, if we uh, if we zoom in uh, a little bit, these are the three same same images. Right. Um, so yeah, so this is this is a style of uh, of illustration called um, grisaille, which means sort of grade. Um, so everything's in. So, so instead of on the one hand, I mean, you could have everything into sort of black and white line drawings, or on the other hand, you'd go for full color. Right. And um, this is this is shades of gray. So this is um, this is a technique that uses line drawing and then and then sort of washes of uh, of gray. Um, and a little bit of colour, you, you might be able to see in the middle of the, uh, on that middle image, um, on the faces there's a little bit of pink, and on the ground and all of the images there's a little bit of green, but they're very sort of neutral tones and it's mainly done in, uh, in grey, so super, it's quite a common technique. Super charming too. Yeah, they're, um, they're, they're, they're very nice little images, they're very nice little images, um, they, as you say, they're very charming. Um, the one on the bottom right, perhaps a little less charming. Someone's giving me a throat cut, but um, right. <laughs> but in terms of the execution of the uh, of the drawings themselves, yeah, they're 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 very nice. So. Great. You could say they're in fact too nice in some ways because um, in our manuscript, unfortunately, at some point, um, well before it came to the Fisher, um, someone decided to cut out one of these. Um, one of these miniatures. In fact, uh, two, I think, that, that this happens, that right. there's two places in the book where this happened. Um, and, and that's what you're looking at there. So um, you can see someone's come along quite neatly cut out, cut out the miniature um, uh, and taken it away with them. The reason you can't see through to the page behind, someone has come along afterwards and kind of repaired it. So they've put a blank piece of parchment over the top um, to, to repair it. But um, yeah. Unfortunately, that, that is that a that, fairly that, common occurrence you see in in early manuscripts. It's not it's not uncommon. Um, it's and in some ways, I mean, obviously, we'd love to have the manuscript with the miniatures, all the miniatures there. In some ways, it's quite nice to have a couple of examples for right. things like teaching, so we we can we can show you know that these sorts of things happen. Right. Um, no, it's not terribly uncommon. Um, now, of course, um, you know we're horrified at the idea of people breaking up books and cutting out miniatures and that sort of thing, although it, it does still go on. Um, but it was much more common practice. And until fairly recently, certainly up, in, up into the 19th um, century and beyond, I mean, it, it's, it's not been an uncommon, an uncommon practice. This person, whoever it was, was quite enthusiastic. The image, the, the, what you can see on the left-hand side there. Right. So what's that? you have to imagine if you turn over that right-hand page, they're cutting from that side. So they're cutting from the back of the page you can see on the right. Right. Um, but they've cut so hard 
that they've actually cut through that page on the left. So they didn't actually cut anything out from it, but they made a number of cuts. So someone's had to come along and, and again, sort of repair that. But, um, mm. but they definitely wanted to get this miniature out. That's, that's, that's for sure. Mm, interesting. That's so, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'd, we'd love to have the, the miniatures there, but it's, it, it can, it's kind of useful. For teaching it. purposes, yes. The, yeah, for teaching. Those are kind of the nice, hap, you know, happy accidents that, uh, that we can live with. Yeah, 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 it's nice. We certainly wouldn't want it with all our manuscripts, but it's uh, it's nice to have a couple of examples. Yeah. So. What's next? so the next one that I have is um, well, before we get into the kind of manuscript itself, we'll, I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the about the provenance. Um, so this is the kind of the history of this particular copy. Um, so who was it made for? I guess uh, and owned it originally, but then all of the different owners right. um, along the line. Um, this one's had a couple of, um, in, uh, yeah, a couple of interesting owners. Um, uh, there's some interesting provenance evidence. Um, on the right there, you can see pretty clearly, uh, this belonged to Pierre Berger, uh, who was Yves Saint Laurent's partner. Mm -hmm. I think he was actually the last private owner of this manuscript before right. it came to Fisher. Um, and he, so, he would have got it bound, do you think? Or would you ever think? Uh, so this binding predates that. So that he, he was quite a collector of, uh, of fine arts more generally, not just manuscripts, but he had, right. he had as well. Um, no, this would have come to him in its current okay. binding, okay. Um, uh, which you can see on the left there. Um, uh, but the binding is very interesting. The binding is, a, a, it's kind of almost a piece of false provenance. Um, <laughs> but it tells us of, the, of about an interesting sort of episode in this manuscript's history. Because if you look at the, you can't really see very, very well with the image I, I've got because we haven't got an image of the spine, but you can you can see the spine on the very far left there. It's got all these compartments with with red leather. Um, if you could actually see those compartments, you'd see that the little bits of gold which you can just see in the corners they're all fleur de lis, mm -hmm. and there's the there's the initials of Louis the Eighteenth, um, so the King of France after the restoration of the monarchy, so after the revolution and, and, and right. Napoleon and all that. Um, so it's in his binding. It's in a royal binding from when he was uh, when he was king but it never belonged to him um it it was offered to him right. apparently in about 1817 okay. 1880 apparently he must have said yes or someone said yes because they put it in this binding which is his binding as it were right um but then in 1819 for some reason it all fell through it went back to its owner the owner clearly quite liked this new binding so they left it in this new Absolutely. binding um, so it looks like, I mean, I, I guess you have to be a little bit careful. It looks like this book from the binding. You'd right. usually conclude from this binding, it must have been in the French royal collection. Right. But in fact, it never was. So you're teasing us. What is the book? So what is the book? Yeah, so let's let's have a look at the book. Um, so this is a manuscript uh, of the Livre de Paix by um, Christine Pizan. Um, so a very important um, uh, writer and thinker in, in France in the uh, in the late uh, Middle Ages, um, sometimes described as the first woman, um, the first woman who was able to make a living as a writer, first professional writer. Right. Um, um, so um, yeah, so so this is the first page uh, again of text, um, beautifully uh, ornamented, beautifully illustrated. I think, yeah. Um, the book itself is a. It's actually kind of. It's kind of similar to that first one we were looking at, the the, the letter to Aristotle. It's again, it's a, it's a book that's been written by an intellectual to a prince, to a ruler, giving them advice. And this is this is quite a um, a widespread genre. Mm -hmm. They call mirrors for princes. Um, so this is a mirror for um, for a prince. Um, so um, so she's writing this book of sort of um, political advice. Um, basically, this time there's a lot of conflict between two different branches of the French royal family. Peace kind of breaks out on a couple of occasions around 1412, 1413. And while that's happened, she writes this book and she writes it to the Crown Prince of France, um, whose name is uh, Louis de Guienne. Um, and there she is in the, in the miniature presenting this book um, to Louis um, with, with this advice on how to, how, to, how to be a good ruler and how to maintain the peace and that sort of thing. And um, we don't ever get to find out whether he took her advice because he died, unfortunately, within about a year of getting this book. Right. Um, he was he had a reputation for being somewhat dissolute i guess 
um so and, and I, I, I if i remember rightly at some point in the text she's sort of like well i'm writing this book to you because you know peace is it looks like peace is, has, has finally come and you've been involved in and in, in, in bringing about peace but she's also she kind of expresses her surprise that he's been able to do this because he's never been really good for much in the past right so, so it's kind of slightly backhanded but anyway as i say he he we, we don't get to find out whether he really does um uh Take on board her advice because he, he did he did die within it within a year or so. He's the Louis. He's the he's the Dauphin who's in Shakespeare's Henry V. He's the oh, baddie. Okay, same guy. Um, you can talk a little bit about how something like this, how a manuscript like this, would be used for teaching because it strikes me that something like this would sort of cross several disciplines. Yeah, so this this is a, a great example of a, of a manuscript that can be used. Um, uh, as you say, in, in, in a lot of different contexts, and it's and that's one of the reasons, obviously, why we want to add, add this sort of diversity. Um, so there's all sorts of um, all sorts of people who are interested in this for research and for and as you say for teaching. So it's a work of political science. Mm -hmm. um, it's a work by uh, by a woman. Um, so um, Christina Pizan certainly in the last few decades has has um, got a lot of attention from uh, feminist critics, um, obviously because she's a very important early. Um, uh, female intellectual uh, in the sort of French literary tradition. Um, art historians are going to be interested in this um, mm -hmm. because it's got this wonderful, um, it's got this wonderful uh, miniature. Um, yeah, so there's all sorts of um, all sorts of ways um, that this could be um, this could be used, and it can be used in all the ways that we'd use all sorts of other uh, all our other medieval manuscripts. You can look at the code ecology, the, you know, the way the book has um, has been made, the way it was put together at the paleography so the style of the writing um so there's yeah there's there's there's, there's so much you can do with um uh, with a book like this in the classroom and again it's got it's got amazing um and, and, correct, me, and correct me if i'm wrong wasn't this one of the first things that you were involved in in acquiring at fisher this was in terms of manuscripts yeah this was uh, when i arrived there was one book that had just been bought um which was the first one we looked at mm -hmm. um so that was the first one i ever cataloged while i was here at the uh, uh, at the fisher um, but this was the first one that I was actually actively involved in purchasing it. Yeah. So this one's this one's kind of special to me for yeah. uh, for that reason as well. Yeah. But it, it's just a wonderful book. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. I've used it on many occasions as well. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's an it's an important text by an important writer. It, it's a it's a beautiful copy. It's very rare. There's only three manuscript copies of this. Mm. Particular. Um. So yeah, it's 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 a great thing to have. Yeah. And just uh, the reason I put that on the bottom left there that that's. Um, Again, talking about provenance, this tells us who the book was originally made for. Mm. Um, so that's a coat of arms. It's a little unclear, um, but it's a coat of arms incorporated into the initial. Right. Um, and it's a it's a gold shield with a red wild cherry tree on it. Um, it's a little bit stylized, but that's the coat of arms of the Creaky family. So this is Jean de Creaky was was the person who um, who had this uh, had this manuscript made. Amazing. So yeah, it's a beautiful manuscript. That first page in particular. The rest of the manuscript's beautifully made as well. I mean, not as not as elaborate all the way through, um, but with very nice um, initials. Mm -hmm. And for an example here, this one again. This page I particularly like because it's um, something's gone a little bit wrong. Um, <laughs> if I'm in, if I'm interpreting it correctly, so you can see that initial is a little bit smudged. Right. Um, what I think has happened, and and you can see the, the uh, kind of shadow sort of image of it appears just above it to the right. right. What I think has happened is someone's managed to put their thumb in it very quickly after it was made. So when it was still sort of wet, right. um, didn't really know what to do. So just stuck their thumb down on the on the uh, on the margin and um I guess there was no cloth we have no, a medieval thumb. No cloth handy. Yeah I mean I guess yeah well yeah, I guess they they, they weren't gonna be caught because you know hmm. fingerprint technology hadn't and and come in so they were they were safe enough doing it that way this does give an example by the way of the um of of the margins you might expect on a manuscript we saw that first one has really small margins this one's managed to preserve its margins they might have been trimmed a little bit but this is much closer to what you'd expect in terms right. of the uh, right. the size of the margins very very uh very readable in that respect. yeah it's a, it's a, it's a pretty clear text the uh, pretty clear sort of script it takes I me mean, a little bit of getting used to but it's um but yeah, this one's this one's um, this one's pretty readable. Mm -hmm. sure. What's next? So the last one I was going to look at is um, uh, yeah another kind of favorite of mine. I have to say it's um, it's it's another book that has a has quite a lot going on. There's a lot of different sort of aspects to it. 
So this is the first two pages. Um, the, the, most of the text in this book is an introduction to heraldry. Um, that's not really what we've got here though, although this is not unrelated. So on the left there we've got what are called the Arma Christi, so it's the arms of Christ, arms in the sort of coat of arms sense, so that's obviously related to heraldry. Um, so we've got yeah, a crucifixion scene effectively, but built around sort of the coat of arms as well. So you've got, you can see the shield there um, and all of the different, what are called the instruments of the passion. So all of the different um, uh, objects that are associated with the, uh, with the crucifixion. Right. Um, so, and then you've got um, um, the Virgin Mary and John the Evangelist, um, as you often, uh, as you often have um, at the, at the sort of base of the cross. Um, so that's on the left. So there's a, there's a heraldry sort of connection there. On the right, we've got God the Father enthroned, wearing a papal tiara, as he often is. Um, and then below that, we've got a bit of text. This is not the main text of this introduction to heraldry. This is actually a poem by a guy called um, Jean Molinet, which is about the Arma Christi. So it's a poem that describes the arms of Christ. Um, and actually, sort of, it's mainly about the second coming. Um, so what this does is sort of turn this introduction to heraldry into a kind of hybrid devotional book, because you've still got that introduction to heraldry, but we've also got this religious, very religious content at the beginning of the, um, uh, at the beginning of the manuscript. So it sort of adds an extra dimension. There are, I think, three manuscripts of this introduction oh, okay. that, include these, um, that include these features. So it's not unparalleled, but it's not common. Um, if we look at the at the rest of the book, you can see it's um, okay. it's Aeon heraldry, um, pretty standard. Yeah, so you've got the text there, sort of explaining how heraldry works, and, and then all the all the different shields. So it's going from left to right. It's getting sort of more and more complicated. You've got the basic colors, tinctures, um, and then in the middle, you've got some of the basic designs, and then on the right, it's a little bit more complicated, um, some more complicated examples. Um, on the left there, you can see this book was used for quite a while. Um, if you look on the far right. Each of the images has captions, as it were. They're above each shield, but they're in red. They're in the same sort of style of handwriting. On the left, if you, on the far left, if you look at the at the writing underneath each shield, it's quite a different style. Right. Um, it's not in red. It's about two hundred years later. Um, so someone was still reading this this manuscript um, in the sixteenth and in, in the seventeenth century. This 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 was made around fourteen ninety. This manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, so someone was reading this yeah, a good couple of hundred years later and, and, and writing notes effectively in it. So. Is that fairly standard as well? I mean, especially when you look through a, a manuscript where you see a number of different hands? It's not something we'd encourage now. <laughs> you, you can't come in and, and start writing books, but um, it's, um, it, it's again, it's not uncommon, not at all uncommon. Yeah. Um, and it's something that in the past people tended not to like, sort of collectors and even li um, libraries when they, were, when they were acquiring manuscripts, they tended to avoid um, or not be so keen on books that someone had written all over. Right. Um, to the extent that uh, booksellers would often wash uh, manuscripts and printed books, um, right. wash the margins to try and get rid of all this stuff. Now that there's a lot more interest in sort of scholarly interest in um, how books were used and how they were read and the history of the book sort of between it, you know, not just when it was made and where it was made, but what happened right afterwards. People are a lot more interested in this sort of, um, this sort of feature because um, it's evidence of you know, when it was used, how it was used. Um, obviously, this person, you know, it looks like they're having trouble remembering, you know, what, what all the different colors were. So they, so, so they, so they went in and, and wrote them all underneath. So it's sort of evidence of, of how they were using this book at a particular time. So now we're, we're quite keen on that sort of, that right. sort of thing. And it's certainly not uncommon. Yeah, it's certainly not uncommon. People write all sorts of things in, the, uh, in their books, uh, including the manuscripts. So I think you have one last thing. Yeah, so I have one last slide of this manuscript, um, which is, yeah, so this is, the, the page on the left was the, originally the last page of this, uh, of this okay. manuscript. You can see, again, it's got a coat of arms. Mm -hmm. But then a section was added at the back of the manuscript. Um, and as you can see, it's still sort of heraldic. Um, it's, it's still, it's another coat of arms. Um, and then there are the, the, on the following pages, there are a whole bunch more examples. Um, what what we think probably happened here, it's not entirely clear, um, is that um, this second section was added to commemorate in some way marriage between the two families. Because we know that someone from the Lae family, and that's the coat of arms on the left, married someone from the Armagnac family, and that's the coat of arms on the, uh, on the right, um, in 1492. Right. 
Um, so yeah, the fact that these two coats of arms are being brought together in this manuscript at about that time um, suggests that this was perhaps repurposed as a as a as a wedding gift, probably to to a guest at the wedding, something like that. It, it's not entirely clear. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's again part of the history of the manuscript, the fact that it was, um, you know, it was complete, finished at that page on the left that you can see, but then quite soon after it was originally made, it got sort of, uh, it got sort of extended in, a, in an interesting way. So. I mean, that's the great thing about these manuscripts is that there's still so much to learn about so many of them that we have. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, we use them a lot for teaching, but there's, the, like you said, it's great research potential and there's, there's, there's always um, more to learn about them. Um, I think the the wedding in question uh, for this one has has been I identified. Um, so, so I think it's Jean Damagnac and um, Yolande de La Haye are the two two people right. in question. But there is debate. Like uh, when we bought this from the bookseller, um, the bookseller's description mentioned this um, marriage um, and said, you know, it's probably something to do with this. And 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 I think um, it was the bookseller that put put forward the suggestion that um, it might have been a, a gift given to a given to a guest at the wedding. Yeah. But um, we've had people come in from the Centre for Medieval Studies since and uh, saying, yeah, there's a good chance it's something to do with this marriage, but I'm not convinced it was a wedding gift. So, you know, there's disagreement. There's, so there's still plenty of scope for kind of research. Um, maybe there is something in the manuscript that's been overlooked that, um, that will solve that, that will answer that question exactly what was going on when they added this extra section. Maybe someone will find some external evidence somewhere. So yeah, no, there's, there, there's, always, more to, there's yeah. always more to find out about these things. Great. So let's, I think you got one last thing to show us. There is one last item that I'm not going to talk a great deal about. This is sort of a little, a little teaser for an event that we have coming up at the, um, at the Fisher. Right. Um, if you're familiar with early, um, uh, early books or books from this sort of period, the, the, uh, the 15th century we're in still here, um, you might have noticed this one's a little bit different. This is not a manuscript. This is not copied out by hand. This is a printed book. Although it looks like it, right? It looks quite a lot like a manuscript. If you look at the style, if you compare the style of handwriting to especially the last couple of, uh, of, of manuscripts we looked at, mm -hmm. um, it's a very similar style of, uh, of, of lettering. Right. Um, and you can see they've left a gap. There's a big um, square gap. That's so that someone can come along and add an elaborate initial of the, of the sort that we've, we've seen in some of the manuscripts we've been looking at. So yeah, it looks, looks quite a lot like a manuscript, mm -hmm. um, but it's not, it's a, it's, uh, it's a printed book. Um, and in fact, it is earlier than the than the last manuscript we looked at. Right. So it's not like, it's not as if suddenly manuscript stops and printing starts. There's you know there's a, there's a lot of this going on at the same time. Right. Um, as I say, I'm not going to say a great deal about this um, book. I will just say that it's um, it's by a very um, important printer, um, Caxton William Caxton, a name that that will probably be uh, familiar to uh, to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, this one's in French. Uh, as you can see, so it fits in nicely with our French manuscripts we've been talking about. It also fits in very nicely with, a, with another um, book printed by Caxton that we got recently, that one's in English. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I, I want to show it today is that um, early in June, we're going to have a, um, uh, an event dedicated just to, to this particular book. We're going to sort of present this, this book um, and talk about you know, why we got it, why it's important, some of the interesting features uh, in it, um, how we managed to acquire it. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to, to show just one page at this point um, of, uh, of this book and um, yeah, look out for that, uh, that event coming up in, uh, uh, in early June. Yes, stay tuned. So why don't you say in the, in the, uh, in the sharing screen, because I've got a couple of questions to ask you. Yeah, sure. So this has been great. I mean, it's, it's really sort of, I mean, you've just, and again, just touched the, touched the surface of, of kind of the collection that we have. Um, is there anything that you, we, you know, you talked a little bit about kind of filling gaps in the collection in terms of the actual, our French manuscript collection now as it exists, where do you see a gap that you would like to fill? This is your chance to yell out to the booksellers that might have something for us, um, that you think that, 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 that you'd love to add to the collection. Oh, well, I mean, there's plenty of things we'd, uh, we're, yeah, we'd love to add to the collection. We've, we've got some great French manuscripts, but there's, there's certainly things we could, um, uh, we could add, we could, it, would be, it would be great to add. Um, yeah, in terms of specifics, um, most of what we got is from, from northern France, um, where there were great centers of manuscript production, Paris and, uh, and other places. 
Um, it would be great to have something from southern France um, mm -hmm. in French um, or in uh, Occitan, um, so which is the sort of French that was spoken in in, in the south of France. Um, those don't come up very often um, either. They're, they're they're not very common. They, they don't come up on the market, they're, and they're, they're expensive when they do come up. But it'll be it'll be great to have an example of, uh, of something like that. Um, it would also be nice to have, um, I mean, something like another interesting to be done. I mean, they don't come up very often either. Um, again, works that um, add sort of diversity to the collection um, in that sort of way. Um, and that's something that we've we've definitely been um, been trying to do, and we were very lucky to get the the, the Christine de Bizon. Um, so yeah, it, it would be nice to get a, a um, it would be nice, as I say, also to get some of these other languages that um, that are that are very hard to come by. I mean, English obviously would be would be the one there that we um, right. we don't have any English manuscripts, um, certainly not complete um, complete books. Um, that would be um, that would be another great great. Um, hole to fill. They do come up sometimes. It's not like that it's absolutely impossible to get them, right. um, but they're not frequent on the market. Therefore, they're expensive and everyone wants one. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of competition and, and obviously English speaking institutions are particularly keen on getting them. So you're competing with American um, institutions. Right. So when you're competing with sort of Harvard, yeah, or Texas plus Oxford, Cambridge, you know, it, it's a tough market, but it's not impossible. So we're hopeful that at some point we can we can add that. So. Well, you've got 25 years probably of Fisher career left, so. Yeah, so this time, this is time. Anyway, thanks, Tim. This has been really great. Um, oh, you're very welcome. Oh. Yeah, I, think the, the, I would, re I would uh, welcome everybody when we do finally open to look at some of these, uh, to request some of these materials yourself, because um, as you said, I mean, the, what we show here are just surrogates. I mean, essentially what you don't get the sort of the feel, the tactile feel. Um, of, of, of these uh, manuscripts. So please, when we do open, uh, please come and visit us and take a look at some of these. So uh, we, uh, we're not sure about our next episode in, in, the, in early May, um, simply because we are in this lockdown order. Um, I would suggest keep, keep uh, your eyes on the website for the, uh, for the announcement of the next Between the Pillows podcast. Um, in the meantime, uh, please tell your friends about all the previous episodes. We, uh, there's 12 or so now. Uh, up on the website so you can watch all those and um, leave your comments, leave some suggestions about what you want to see uh, that, that we cover next. So again, thanks, Tim. Um, and thank you to everybody for watching and enjoy your weekend.